So uh, let me just, let's, let's just back up for a minute. So you're not one of these people who has written a zillion books. You've only written a few books, but they have such presence on the lists, on the bestseller list, in our awareness. It shapes conversation that people have. And the, the beautiful thing about them is they all have something in common. They have sort of, uh, it's an anatomy of innovation and genius. And by the way, there are many people who one would give that title to, but this particular set are people who have, have, a, have connected in their own lives and in their own creativity lines of science with lines of art. Mm -hmm. And so, if I can just understand from you what motivated you to make this kind of your latter-day mission in life, to explore these characters for our benefit. Well, you do that as well. And I think one of the important things is, you know, if you're at the 92nd Street Y or Time Magazine, you meet a lot of smart people. And then you realize, smart people are a dime a dozen. They don't usually amount to much. <laughs> <laughs> it's creative people. And so I wanted to do what is creativity and how do you achieve it? And to me, the essence of it is being able to love all disciplines, like, you know, you with science and art. And so I look at people who stand at that intersection, which obviously Ben Franklin did, but especially when I did Steve Jobs, he would always end his product presentation with that slide of the arts connecting to the sciences and say that's where creativity occurs. And then the ultimate of that, and the real symbol of that, is Vitruvian Man, which is a great work of science and a great work of art. And so I decided to the capstone of these books would be the self-taught guy. I mean, you know, you talk about Einstein a lot in your latest book, I did it. We're never, maybe you will, but we're never quite gonna be like Einstein. I mean, he had a processing power that was almost as if touched by lightning. Leonardo was born out of wedlock, didn't go to school, had trouble with math, but he's so observant and so curious, that's what made him a genius. So, I, 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 let me reaffirm a statement you just made that however rare a smart person might be in your life, in the world, smart people are actually not uncommon. And it takes an extra spark beyond that to shape the world and to innovate exactly. the world. Because uh, the person who gets straight A's, they're not necessarily, and in fact, I would say most of the time are not the people who actually make the difference in this world. It's a curious, interesting fact. They're the ones who write the biographies of the people. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, just to just to reiterate that, we've got uh, of your biographies, you've got Ben Franklin, one of my favorite uh, uh, characters, who's under celebrated as a scientist. Right. Historically. I mean, we think of him as a doddering old dude flying a kite in the rain. Yeah. Those electricity experiments, as you know, but most of the audience may not are the most important experimental and then theoretical when it comes to the single fluid theory of electricity. He would have thought you were a Luddite or you know, a Philistine if you didn't know science. But nowadays, as you've done with your books, people who know the arts and humanities often feel intimidated by science. And uh, Ben Franklin was somebody who thought that was crazy. You're supposed to combine science with humanity. And he was as famous, if not more famous, as a scientist across Europe than he was a diplomat in, oh, in representation he snatched of... Oh, the lightning from the skies as Cortes, when he goes to France. You know, they turn out on the streets to watch him make the progression as the ambassador, not because he's a famous diplomat, but because he has snatched lightning from the gods. He has discovered lightning rod. Now, my, my, my only uh, regret about him, no, it's not a regret, I'm just, something I'm pissed off about. Yeah. Uh, so we've got him on our money, yeah. all right? So if you didn't know he's on our currency, you just have to work harder because he's yes, on the right. hundred dollar bill, <laughs> Right. okay? He's on the hundred dollar bill. Yeah. Uh, and you look on both sides and there is no iconography of his scientific interest. Really? As there would be for any other scientist 
that's on a bill historically throughout Europe mm -hmm. uh, before the, the euro came in. You had scientists. But you know the first euro, what it was on it? Well, who? Because they kept fighting, they couldn't yeah, do it? Yeah, of course. Vitruvian Man. Oh, nice. The first euro. Nice, very nice. So well, Leonardo. Yeah, Leonardo. You gets know, the one thing they could all agree on. Oh, you've got there it. it. Yeah, is. there we go. Uh huh. That's not a euro. That's actually his notebook page. <laughs> so let's let's get to let's get to Leonardo. So, uh, so he was an outcast. Give me the the, the list of oh, things he that was he. Oh, he's a total misfit. Misfit. That's and, the word. And um, you know, and you remember Steve Jobs' wonderful line: "Here's to the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs in the square hole." Leonardo was born out of wedlock, didn't go to school, was gay, left-handed, somewhat heretical, uh, vegetarian, and yet in Florence, he's totally embraced. And this is something, a lesson we have to learn, is that at that time in the 1470s in Florence with the Medici running things, it was a republic that was so tolerant of people coming from the Arab world after the fall of Constantinople, people from Africa, people from all over, people of different uh, religious, as you know, the Reformation is a, starting to bubble up in a way. And so Leonardo wearing pink and purple short tunics, which uh, Dude, I just, good I looking. To, I have to process this. Everything you listed about his misfititude could have gotten him burned at the stake in some place in the world in some time throughout history. He did get arrested uh, for sodomy. Uh, fortunately, among the four people arrested was a member of the Medici family, so boom, they get off. <laughs> Things were slightly corrupt then. If you, get, is that, the way, if you get arrested, get arrested with someone rich, right? Is that how? I think people already know that in this audience. <laughs> You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> But I will say, to not get political on it, but you put it, it was a time of great tolerance, which is why you have great creativity. But sometimes you backslide. And Savonarola comes in in the 1490s with the bonfire of the vanities, and they start burning at the stake, gays and others. Uh, the good news is it lasted less than four years, and he was then... Uh, gotten rid of, but we all know what it's like to backslide from an era of tolerance. <laughs> so, um, I as an educator and people who have kids in school or anyone who's thought about it at all, uh, one of the deep questions we harbor is, are, are you born innovative or is it something that can be taught? Mm -hmm. or something that we don't know how to teach and we still need to figure it out. And so do you, you must have insights into yeah, that I question right now. Yeah, I do believe, and the theme of this book is mainly that you don't have to be born that way. Leonardo, by not having been sent to school and been, you know, infused with the scholastic, you know, medieval stuff they were teaching in schools, makes a list every week in his notebook of things he wants to learn. And he does it out of pure curiosity as a little kid in the village of Vinci, and he just teaches himself. And he'll say, you know, find out why water swirls when it goes from a larger to a smaller channel. Why is the sky blue? He does experiments with vapor and uh, light. He, you know, describe the tongue of a woodpecker. Who on earth wakes up in the yeah, morning yeah. other than you <laughs> and says, I want to know what the tongue of a woodpecker looks like? But it's pure curiosity and then observant. He'd say, look at the wings of birds. Do they move up faster or down faster when they take off? These are all things we can teach ourselves or at least pledge not to hammer out of our children, which is curiosity for its own sake daydream, imagine, fantasize, and observe. So something I've said for a while is, you know, we spend the first years of our children's lives teaching them to walk and talk. Yeah. And then we spend the rest of their lives telling them to shut up and sit down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so this is not commensurate with the... the Absolutely. The it's promotion a nice of job, curiosity. But it's true, which is we sometimes say, you know, quit asking questions. Yeah. And Leonardo to his deathbed, to his last page, you, you would know the classical mathematical uh, challenge of squaring the circle. Yeah, you can't do it, yeah. Yeah, but as a little kid, 
It's because pi is a very irrational number, and Neil can explain <laughs> it to you at some point. But he tries in his notebook as a young kid, and his last notebook page, he's still using right triangles, shading things, so trying to, to square it. the circle, because nobody ever said, hey, you know, quit asking questions. So, I, so there are two elements of this that I want to make sure people recognize. There's being curious, but the combination of being curious and being observant. Correct. Oh my what gosh, that's, that's where you take off. So what you're saying is his, his mind was nurtured. So you can't say he was just born doing this. He was simply curious and observant. And that, that recipe can drive, and if it's insatiable, my gosh, there is no limit to... And we have 7,000 pages or more of his notebook pages. Well, I thought you were describing the length of this book. No, no, no. Oh, no. sorry. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> so, it's on heavy stock paper because I, I want to give a plug to Simon & Schuster. Okay. Which was, I said, look, this is the big one, the final one. Put it on 80-pound stock, pure white, coated. We can afford it and keep it the same price. And now the book weighs 80 pounds. Yes, See? but That's it, what happens when you put but it on 80 But it means you have oh, color you have, throughout. You have, co you have color imagery throughout yeah. this. It's, it's, it's not one of the... And so every now and then, it was like learning from Leonardo. How do you just try to make it perfect? Now, I know the book's not perfect, but even the fonts and the paper. So uh, Simon Schuster deserves... I have... Um, one of the editors, Stuart uh, Roberts, is in the audience. You met him earlier. So I want to make sure they get their shout out. But going back to your observant thing, on these notebook pages, you just watch a mind dancing across nature where he's trying to figure out, OK, how does a bubble, set of bubbles affect the swirl when something comes up? Let me observe it. How, he says one of his notebook entries is, go down to the moat near the castle and looked at four-winged dragonflies to see if their wings alternate or go up and down in unison. And he observes it. Now, the cool thing about it is every one of these things is something you and I can observe. So when I'm walking here, I try now to do that little pause as if we were still in our wonder years before people beat it out of us to say, why does the light hitting a shiny object have a glitter and a glint, but it moves differently than the shadow moves when you move your head. This is something Leonardo observed. He observed when he's dissecting the human face to do the Mona Lisa smile. Wait, that wait, the, the, fact, the fact that that's even a thing to think to do. He dissected 30 it's human like, faces. I want to draw a face, so let me dissect a cadaver's face. Every who, muscle. Who thinks, who thinks this? Because he drilled down and did it partly because it was useful, he needed the smile, but then he drills down and he's like doing the spinal cord and the nervous system and everything. You don't need that to paint the Mona Lisa smile, but you do need it if you're Leonardo. So how does he gain access to dead bodies? Uh, there was uh, a tolerance, as I said, both in Florence and later in Milan, where the church, which had banned autopsies and dissections, right. Uh, the church is not as strict then. Uh, I mean, the Pope has a son, Caesar Borgia, so you can tell they're not exactly strict the way it was. And so they start <laughs> for a period. For those Jews in the audience. Yeah. Popes the, are supposed to be celibate. Pope is, should be the most celibate Catholic in... in yeah. yeah, and okay. uh, the Medici Pope were not. Um, popes were not. Um, and so they do allow dissections both in the hospital, the hospital in uh, Florence, and then in uh, Milan. He works every night in the basement, and he does something that you would really appreciate, which is the visual display of information. He's a person who not only figures out how the heart valve works, but, I mean, here's just one. I mean, this is not a bad mm -hmm. visual mm -hmm. display of information, the fetus in the womb. And so... He does dissections, but he also combines them with art. So up till now, we've only really been describing what in modern times we might call a naturalist. Mm -hmm. Someone who observes nature, is curious about it. They might sketch it, but that alone doesn't make you an artist. So what came first, or did, or did they both develop 
yeah. in tandem, the art in him and the science in him, and, and, and the engineer. Right, you know. art, science, and engineering, all the brushstrokes of the beauties of nature. And at a certain point, when I'm at Windsor Castle, where some of his notebooks are, looking at the swirls he does called the deluge drawing, I said to the curator there, do you think he did that initially as a work of art or as a work of science? The same question you asked. As only a curator at Windsor Castle can do, he raised himself into his full glory of five feet four and looked down upon me and said, I do not think that Leonardo would have made that distinction. And that's what sort of occurred to me, is that nature in all of its forms, is Vitruvian man a work of science, or work of art, or a work of math? Leonardo felt it was all together. So it is our, um, dare I say, frailty of mind to even ask that question, presuming everything was compartmentalized, and then he physically connects them when he makes no distinction whatsoever. Right, we them. silo things. We have right. departments in university. Yes. You get in the Department of Astrophysics, and unlike Einstein, you don't also get taught music at the same time, or maybe, you know, most people don't. And it's the people who do not silo knowledge and see the patterns across nature that's another part of creativity. Uh, in my field, we were one of the earliest out of the box to try to cross-pollinate not so much art and science, but one silo of science to another silo mm -hmm. of science. So NASA in the 1990s created the Origins Project, which was not, here's this science, we have funding for that science, it's Origins. So right. you pose the question, uh, uh, how, do, how was Earth formed? Well, you need the astrophysicists, the geologists, there's the biologists where life is making its footprint. And so that forced collaborations that created whole new journals, journals of sort of, of, of astrobiology, journals of astrogeology. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's, that's an attempt to accomplish sure. this more we formally. Sure, we really have to be more cross-disciplinary in our thinking. Uh, let's, talk, uh, let's talk about uh, Leonardo's sort of engineering, because this is a under-recognized element of his background. In his notebooks, there are drawings of all kinds of machines. And I don't, did they make these machines? Did somebody? No, a lot of them are fantasy. And one of the things I discovered from the notebooks is that his early main job was as a theater and spectacle producer for the Medici. In other words, he did the mechanics, the scenery, the art, because this was a big deal, like Joseph Papp was a big deal when we were growing up, to have public spectacles. So that helicopter that you know, that aerial screw that's very famous, I discovered it wasn't initially to transport humans, it was to bring angels down from the rafters in a performance of Danai, a play that they were putting Whoa. on. But then, being Leonardo, it's like, let me blur the line between imagination and reality. Let me indulge fantasy. And so he says, well, okay, let me try to make human-powered flying machines. And so that's another secret of Leonardo, another thing we hammer out of our kids, which is indulge fantasy. Yeah, and uh, I don't know who has not seen that image. It's a, it has, it's a corkscrew spinning, mm -hmm. uh, not so much propellers, but imagine a corkscrew made large. Right. And this, uh, if it spins, you knew air would be shifted down or up, depending on which way you turned it. And, and he discovers a lot on aerodynamics because of it, and even discovers, you know, that what we call Bernoulli's principle, or you call Bernoulli's principle, <laughs> uh, which is that if air is flowing over a curved side, it's moving faster, and so the air pressure is less, and it lifts. Right. That's how the aerial screw works, and he discovers it. But it's really cool because he loves patterns across nature, and he discovers that water cannot be compressed, even though air can be. So it doesn't work for fish swimming. So he puts in his notebook, why do fish swim faster in water than birds fly in air because water is heavier? And he goes on to observe this principle. So these are things that normally we don't stop to notice 
but he does. Uh, uh, now that you mentioned Bernoulli, <laughs> uh, let me just do, do a quick demo here for everyone. Okay. So, oh, then, oh these are my notes. I shouldn't have torn those. That's all right. <laughs> all right. We seem to be flying fine without <laughs> notes. <laughs> so, uh, this sheet of paper is, is curved over. So if I blow air across it, you'd think it would just keep pushing it down. Right. And then, but if you do that. No, it flaps up because the air pressure is less. So there's lower air pressure above and higher below. And on an airplane, this is why you can fly. One of several reasons why And you, can fly. you see that fluid dynamics and hydraulics and everything he does, including it all comes together in the Mona Lisa. The dissection of the eye to figure out optics, the lips and mouth, but also the flow of the river and how it curves and goes into her. There are people who've written about Leonardo, including the great Kenneth Clark, who wrote about him last century, who was an art critic, who said, if he hadn't wasted so much time doing geology and aerodynamics <laughs> and optics, he could have painted more paintings. And I think the Mona Lisa He could answer, have been a great painter yeah, if he didn't. Yeah, but the Mona Lisa answers with a smile because just knowing the flow, the fluid dynamics, I think is so key. To, it starts when he's a young kid. He's working for Verrocchio. He does We're the back for Verrocchio, who's a... You said it like we... Like yeah, Pinocchio. We all know. Uh, uh, Verrocchio runs a shop in Florence. That makes a copper ball for the top of the dome on the Florence Cathedral, but the you know, you know, famous uh, dome. Uh, but he does art. He does pageants. He does costumes. He does props. That was the cool thing about Florence, is it didn't say, you're an artist, you're a jewelry maker. Verrocchio was trained as a gold beater, a jewelry maker, and you're an engineer. They all kind of worked in these do-it-all shops. And Leonardo, among other things, besides soldering the ball that's on top of Brunelleschi's dome on the cathedral, he does the river in the baptism of Christ. He's like 12 years old, and you see the ripples doing it exactly right scientifically. These would be eddies that come yeah. if you come around. Yeah, a the eddies, and that's when he discovers his most important scientific discovery was an anatomy one, which is the heart valve. And this is just huge. People thought that the heart valve pumped up and down because the blood would come out of the heart, push it open, and then the pressure would push it down. He has his eddies that he's learned as a kid invented. He said, no, it would crumple if that were the case. The reason is when it goes into the aortic valve, I mean the aorta, it's smaller, so it forms the eddy, and the eddy spreads out the membrane. This is what happens when you can both do the Mona Lisa and discover how a heart valve works. So now I'm a little worried because how would you know what moving blood does in a heart? He dissected many times. <laughs> the person's live, dead. No, live pig. Oh, live, okay. Because he dissects the human See, heart. See, I was onto something there, right? He yeah. definitely worked. Yeah. I mean, here's some of his spiraling drawings. But in his second round of anatomy, he realizes that he's got to, uh, uh, you know, figure out the heart but he's got to figure out the fluid in it. And so he does, so he does. live pigs. It, 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 Which, by the way, I mean, you're an artist, you're Leonardo da Vinci, you're wearing all these purple and pink tunics and stuff, and yet at night, you're butchering live pigs to figure out how the heart works. This is when you get very, very curious. You know, you're so, uh, you know. And of course, the, the word for that is, uh, in biology is vivisection. Where yeah. the, the uh, you can't is alive. see it here, but this is the heart valve discovery. It shows the, the turning of the fluids, moving the membrane. He describes in his mirror script how he's done. And then he even shows you how to do a glass experiment using grass seeds to prove it right. So and, you can follow where the seeds go. Right, and their, they only totally proved him correct about 30 years ago using iodine and MR, magnetic resonance imaging. It's saying, yes, it flows that way. But hey, one now, Walter, nobody can see these pictures. I know, they, but... They're 100 feet, they so that can. means they have to buy the they book can. now. They can. You gotta they buy the book They can buy now. the book, <laughs> or I can put them up. But I'll show you one other sweet thing, which you can't really see. <laughs> On the, I told you he was gay, mm -hmm. and he has a... Yeah, so what's the, what's the best evidence... I guess he was arrested well, for sodomy. No, but Salai, I mean, we have pictures. I mean, he's 
quite open about it. He draws okay. pictures of Saleh all the time. Saleh comes to a dinner parties, and then he, later in life, Meltzi is his companion, but he has two very upfront companions. But on the 15th page of heart drawings, where he finally gets it right, he gets to the last note, and he draws a heart one more time, and he's human. His mind wanders, and there's another sketch of Salai. He oh. draws it to show the Who's heart inside his boyfriend. So, he This tale works better than when I tried it in some other cities, by oh. the way. <laughs> I, I like Manhattan. <laughs> People going, ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're going, ah. <laughs> You're Florence. I've been to places that were uh, uh, Rome. <laughs> so he sounds like he was a little bit ADD. You know, he was very distracted, and he'd hop around to many things, but he was also deeply focused. I mean, well, that's, that's a, yeah, that, that's, right. That's but in he's there. very compulsive in terms of squaring the circle. I mean, in the book. There's just page after page of notebooks, 230 times he's trying to do it. The proportions of man that he does for Vitruvian man are just obsessive. He also is depressed at times, and he does his deluge drawings and tells a heart, tales about it. And he's elated, somewhat manic and whatever, very friendly. Uh, people say, was he autistic? Well, no, he had a huge number of very close friends, very personable at understanding people's gestures. But I do fear because people always ask these questions, that if he were alive today, we would pull down that diagnostic manual or whatever and put all sorts of three and four letter OCD, ADD, ADHD on him and probably put him on a pharmaceutical regimen. And so, so that would get rid of his ADD and his depression and all these things. And we'd get rid of the Mona Lisa. And we get rid of the Mona Lisa. And interesting, if we, if we know from this evidence, circumstantial and otherwise, that he would not have been on the autism spectrum because most of that spectrum would not involve eye contact with another he human being. He was extraordinarily good with eye. By the way... So, so with Mona Lisa... Wait, wait, real quick, look up there. That's a self-portrait. Mm. That's him, and the eye contact is something that's pretty intense. And so, and of course, if you've never done this, it's spooky. You get even just a reproduction of the Mona Lisa and just walk past it and her eyes follow you as mm -hmm. you go by. Yeah, just do, just... It's called the Mona Lisa effect. And oh, it's got a name, Mona yeah, Lisa effect. Yeah, and it's because the way the shadows work, mm -hmm. he understands optics and shadows. But if I... So everybody get up and just walk <laughs> around, and you'll see. But I'll show you, if you don't mind, one more thing that's even more interesting scientifically Look, we spent at least a minute on the sure. Mona Lisa? It's the so, Mona Lisa here. Right, that's what I'm going to do here. Okay. Which is, besides the eyes, which I have a whole section on the book of why they move, he had dissected the lips, as I told you, right, where he, the human cadavers, and does every muscle and every nerve that touches the lips. So it's very scientifically accurate. But he had also dissected the human eye, and figured out that at the very center of the retina, uh, the cones and fovea see black and white detail, which is something that's true. He's got it right. But the edges of the retina see colors and shadow. So if you're looking directly at something, you see the detail. But if something's coming out of the corner of your eye, you see the shadow. So for 16 years, he paints a smile with more than 200 layers of glaze perfect. And if you look really close at the smile, and I've, you, know, you can see it close up in the book, the, the corners of the lip turn down slightly. But the shadows and colors turn up. So if you stare directly at her, she suddenly is not quite smiling. It's more mysterious. But as your eye wanders to her forehead or cheek or chin, suddenly the smile lights up because you're catching it in a different part of your retina. So it's just an example of how the science makes the smile interactive, almost as if it's a you know, virtual reality. So, so one point I'd take this moment to make, that there's some who would argue that knowing the science might subtract from someone's art, because that would make it boring or distractive. Mm -hmm. And here is the example of the, not, not now appealing for a scientifically literate artist, which would have no less value to society 
as an artistically literate scientist. <laughs> um, and so, so to know all of this, uh, he now has the power to capture it right. beneath the layers of art that sit above it so that it's more real than anything everyone, anyone And imagined. that's one of the arguments of my book against the Kenneth Clark thesis, which is had he not dissected the eye, had he not done the lips, had he not studied geology and understand how rivers flow into roads, flow into our veins, and that they have the exact same curves as our veins, you would not have the Mona Lisa. There is a painting in the Louvre. I, I forgot that I wrote it down. I don't have it with me now. You where, tore it up and did Bernoulli <laughs> on it. No, <laughs> no there's a cul-de-sac, and there are trees surrounding the cul-de-sac, mm. and there's a sun in the sky, and all the shadows of the trees all point into the center mm -hmm. of the cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, no! Mm -hmm. This is not what shadows do. Correct. And so this, these are people who just were not observant about what they were painting. And then I hear people who are sort of apologists for them saying, oh, he probably did that on purpose. Okay, so every missing fact of nature that you didn't get right in your painting, somehow they did that on purpose? I'm, I'm not buying it. Okay, let me go to Salvador Mundi on that point, okay. if I may. Some of you may know of Salvador Mundi. It's on display at Christie's. It's going to be sold November 15th, the only one in private hands. There's a whole lot of science here, the way our eyes see Wait, wait, let's just back up. So this is a painting confirmed to have been... Confirmed only in the past 10, 12 years to have been an authentic Leonardo. We knew it existed. It disappeared in the 1700s because some stupid British royal sold it to some ne'er-do-well nephew and... We lost track of it. It was rediscovered and authenticated as a Leonardo. It is now going on auction at Christie's with a $100 million minimum, which is very inexpensive for the only one of Leonardo's 15 finished paintings in private hands. But I'm now going to do a piece of science on you. First of all, the hand is sharp, which he doesn't usually do, sharp lines. Uh, people thought that couldn't be Leonardo. He never does sharp lines. I look in the notebooks, at the very same time he's doing this, 1502, he's doing not just a distance perspective, but acuity perspective, which you would know what it is, sharpness perspective, which means at a certain focal point, lines are actually sharp, but if I'm looking at something a little distance mm -hmm. it is. So it makes yeah, it- In photography, that'd just be the depth of field. Correct. So depth of field but forces your, your plane of attention, right? simply so by he, being in focus. And so what he's doing there is making something look three-dimensional on a two-dimensional plane. But here's the thing you should look at, because you're a scientist. A crystal orb with the inclusions exactly right, the three inclusions perfect, crystal, but what's odd about it, it doesn't distort the robes of Jesus Christ. As you know, any lens, any object, if you take a goblet of water and you put your finger behind it, you'll see it distorted and inverted sometimes. So this gets to your question of why did Leonardo get it, paint it incorrectly, the way nature would not have it. And so my answer would just be, it's Jesus. <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> And that is the answer I come to, uh -huh. which is there are three possibilities. One is that he didn't know, just made a mistake. No. That, you can't, no. I can't. No, no he's no. done his optics experiments. He's studied crystal. He's doing lenses because he wants to focus sunlight in order to be soldering irons and to be weapons. So we know he knows. The other is that he knows, but it would be too distracting, the way there's some fakery in The Last Supper. Like everybody's on the same side of the table. That's right. not the way we usually have dinner parties. Right, right. So he's it's doing like and leaning yeah, like this. Yeah. yeah. I'm like so that. he knows it would right. just you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Everybody in the Last Supper is like yeah. dramatically Why? Why dramatically? Because he's a theater producer and he's producing it as a dramatic narrative. But to get to this, the second explanation is it's too distracting. He knows it would distort, but decides not to do it because then you wouldn't even look at the face of Jesus. You go, boy, goodness, what's happened to the robes? The third explanation is the one you just gave, which is this is Salvador Mundi, Christ the Savior of the world. And he knows that it would distort, and he knows some of his viewers would know. But he's imparting to Salvador Mundi, as savior of the world, 
the miraculous quality of nothing he touches is distorted, as the Bible tells us, and he's showing it's a miracle. And I think that's the explanation that you gave. Yeah, I, I, that, yeah. given everything else we know he knows, yep. and what he was curious about, there's no way that was an accident. Correct. That that happened that way, for mm -hmm. sure. So this is going for, for how much? Uh, the minimum got, is 100 yeah, yeah. million. All right, let's see. There are people, yeah. look, with all, there are people in this zip code <laughs> for whom they've spent as much on a yacht. Yeah, yeah. You could buy this painting, have be the only private owner of a Leonardo. You can put it on permanent display at the Met, which they would very much love. And there are people whose names I won't mention because I've talked to them because they've called me because I'm, you know, I have a whole, I didn't know it was going to go on sale, but I have a whole part in this book because it's so much science and art connected, uh, whose names you would know and whose zip code you live in who are thinking of going up to at least 150 million trying to bid for this. Mm. I, boy, it's it's I on display money. now as a pre-auction. Uh, uh, on Monday at Christie's on 51st Street, opening at 9 a.m., the public can come see it, mm -hmm. and it's awesome. Oh, you've already seen it, but you're not the public. That's the thing. I, uh, and I'm Just also say the, yes to that question. Yes, I'm yes. Not, okay. I am the public. <laughs> um, and it was actually in, Luke Sison, who's at the Met here, that I won't get into too much detail, but it was one of the people authenticated. It was in the 2011-2012 show at the, in the National Gallery in London, where okay. I first saw it. Mm -hmm. And that's when it was first, first, to be authenticated, you have to have a major show that puts you in, and that's like good housekeeping stamp. Right, but. right. Uh, so uh, before we end this and continue on with questions from the audience, uh, could you just comment on Leonardo's capacity, either written or in practice, to, um, or his, his inventiveness with military machinery, catapults, yeah. this sort of thing. When he Just turns, give us some reflections on that. When he turns 30, an unnerving milestone in our lives, if we can remember it, uh, he has messed up two paintings that he hasn't finished, Adoration of the Magi and St. Jerome, that his father, the notary, had notarized the contract. So he decides, I gotta get out of here. So he moves to Milan and he writes an amazing job application letter to the Duke of Milan. It's 11 paragraphs long, thank God we have it in his notebook. This is resume, basically. Yeah, and it's, the, well, it's a, his dream resume. It's okay. slightly fantasy, like everything Leonardo does. Ten paragraphs are engineering. I can make weapons of war. I can make crossbows that would destroy them. I can make fortresses that are impregnable. I can divert the course of rivers. They think of diverting the Arno to defeat Pisa. I can, you know, all these engineering things. Only in paragraph 11 does he say, I can also paint. <laughs> so he thinks of himself as a military engineer, and for reasons that I'll let psychologists try to figure out, I have some speculation, he really decides that's what he wants to do in his 30s for a while. Now he makes a lot of big military drawings, tanks, crossbows, all those. With all due respect to Leonardo, and I love him as much as anybody, they were mainly uh, fantasies. They stretched things that would not be built for another 100 or 200 years. So he was not a great military engineer. He did do one huge thing in military thing. And you've seen it a bit because of our Defense Innovation Board if you went to uh, Fort Meade or the Defense Mapping Agency. Leonardo, in a scene that DiCaprio, who bought the rights of this, should put in the movie, is holed up in the winter of 1503 in the tiny town of Amola with Niccolo Machiavelli and Cesar Borgia. They're both working for the warlord Cesar Borgia. And Leonardo has Salai, his companion, pace off every one of the streets, 15 blocks, tiny town, and look at him, and he does it with him, and he does an aerial map, almost directly aerial view, but maybe a five-degree skew, so you can see the three-dimensionality of it. And as Machiavelli writes in The Prince, which is about Caesar Borgia in that winter, he won not by weaponry, but by surprise. He always knew where he was, and the enemy was 
better than anybody else on the battlefield. So what Leonardo does by doing this notion of a map, there were no drones or blimps or balloons back then, so he has to imagine what it looks like from the air. That's actually a huge military step forward, which as we've seen on the Defense Innovation Board, you go to the mapping agency, it looks like that Amola map. So, so many things that he would do that we take for granted today, but somebody had to do them first. Yeah, and, and it has to combine as we started this conversation with imagination and observation. And uh, just to give sort of one uh, light to sort of wrap this in a bow, um, you can imagine, not to put words in your mouth, but I, I, I'm, I presume you can imagine he being born at a different time and a different place, and none of this would have been nurtured. So could you sort of take us out before we go to Q&A? Sure on reflecting what kind of an environment right. is a necessary condition for this to happen at all. Right, the environment of creativity is such an important topic and it's something I dwell on in this book. As I said, Florence was just the right place. Had the tolerance, had different people coming in from places, it all of a sudden had big shops that were doing everything from soldering the copper ball to drawing, you know, painting the baptism of Christ. So people with different ideas are coming in and not being criticized for having different ideas. Correct. They're being celebrated for that. And fact. they're sometimes not from the upper classes going to university, they're self-taught. What happens in 1452, when Leonardo and Christopher Columbus are born in the fall of Constantinople to bring the Arab wisdom of math to Italy, is Gutenberg opens his first print shop. So we start seeing in Leonardo's notebooks Ask the astronomer so-and-so how to measure the sun, and then buy the Ptolemy uh, translation at the stationers by the bridge. So you have a confluence of tolerance and innovation. You see that at other times. 500 years to the day almost later, you see in the Bay Area of California, huge tolerance, free speech movements, electric Kool-Aid acid tests, but also three inventions occurring. The computer, the microchip, and the network, the internet, all come together to have another time when people can find out what they want and do what they want. So you have to sort of nurture these times of creativity, and especially in Manhattan now, where the next wave will be on health and biotech as well as big data, how will you nurture that so this city remains the you know, cradle of creativity? It's amazing how much time, energy, and laws we spend um, silencing people who are just simply different and mm -hmm. with different views. And when you don't, you get Florence and a Renaissance. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, if we can bring the house lights up a bit. And we have uh, someone up top. We didn't forget you guys up in the, in the bleachers. Um, and so if you have a question for, for Sir Walter, and, and while they're finding you, uh, we'll go up front here. Just while, did, you, did I hear you correctly that Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. bought what? Uh, the, the I, I know rights, what I've read in the papers. And the film rights to Leonardo Da Vinci's yes. story? Well, you know... Um, okay, I just want, I yeah. want to hear that right. That's all. That's all. We're I'm good. I'm hoping you'll play for it. Yeah. We're good. Uh, front row here, sir. Thank you. Um, That's all right. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll just speak loud. There we go. Uh, Walter, I, I, you've written some great biographies, and others like McCullough have written some good ones, too. As you think about that bookshelf of great people that need to be written about, whether or not you write the next one, who needs to be on that shelf? Well, on contemporary people, uh, I think they're very creative people whose biographies haven't been done. I think Bill Gates is one. Jeff Bezos is another. People like that. I don't think Elon Musk. Elon Musk. I think they're not quite ripe. When I was, when Steve Jobs first called to ask me, you know, if I'd do his book, I kind of said, you know, I'd done Ben Franklin, Einstein. He says, do me next. I'm going, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I said, I'll wait 30 years until you retire. And then I got told that he was keeping it secret, but he had been diagnosed. 
Um, so I don't think Diagnosed they're ripe. Diagnosed cancer. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think uh, those are ripe yet. I think in history, um, uh, Lorenzo, de, Lorenzo the Magnificent, Lorenzo de Medici, I became fascinated by, uh, and I don't think there's a great, I'll get, if this is being tweeted out, I'll get some email from somebody who's written a biography of him, but I didn't find one. Also, there are a lot of women, I tried in The Innovators to begin and end with Ada Lovelace, Lord Byron's daughter, who combines poetry and processors to come up with the concept of a general purpose computer. And she is a theme throughout the book, which is augmented intelligence versus artificial intelligence. I think it, she'd be a difficult biography because she only wrote one great scientific paper. There's not, but I think she would be a good biography. Excellent. Another question over here. Uh, it seems like Einstein was famous uh, during his time, and um, Franklin, famous in France anyway. Was Leonardo da Vinci yeah. famous? Very much so. Uh, first of all, he was a bit of a show person. He, uh, as I said, wore, you know, fancy dress and tunics and all. Uh, when the, he's doing the Last Supper, it becomes, and this is the 1490s, it becomes a public event. People are going to the monastery, to the dining room there where he's painting it. It's just on the just, wall. It's right. on the wall yeah. to watch him paint. There are huge lines when he gets back to Florence, and he's just done uh, uh, St. Anne, uh, uh, the Madonna, and child drawing for what will become a great painting. And just to see his preparatory drawing, we're told by contemporaries, there are crowds there to see it. And I'll just supplement that by saying um, what might not be true always among artists is essentially always true among scientists that if you're a great scientist, you're famous in your day. Your contributions are known mm -hmm. in the moment, and particularly when they're applied and they change society. So, um, and scientists are, I would say, can be as famous in life as they are in death, mm -hmm. whereas art, you, you're up, your stock value goes up after you die. Is that correct? Right, right. Yeah. Also, uh, what's up with that? Why, why? <laughs> Well, uh, well, Picasso was highly celebrated in life, of course. Right, right. But there yeah. are some great geniuses, especially in the arts, that are not celebrated mm -hmm. in their time. I think partly because science, there's just a, an aha breakthroughs, mm -hmm. and then they get proven right. Yeah. Like there's an eclipse, as you know, <laughs> that suddenly proves Einstein's general relativity is correct. Right. And it's the, f the headlines the in headlines. the New York Times. Headlines. It's like... You know, lights, it was back when the New York Times knew how to write headlines. But you remember this headline, right? I uh, remember reading, lights all askew in the heavens, men of science more or less agog, Einstein's theory proven correct. Yeah, yeah. Great that headline. was a general theory relativity demonstrated by the 1919 total solar eclipse. Eclipses are pretty common, by the way, if yeah. you didn't otherwise know that. Um, and the theory had just been published in 1916, so it was experimentally ver verified within three years, and popped. First of all, I'll give the advice that I, the whole book is about and the whole theme is, cross disciplines. Don't just major, people say you gotta major in coding, you have to know how to code for the future. Now, machines will code for us, but the creativity connected to the code is what we will do. So I would always try to do a dual major which would be music and physics, or art <laughs> and mathematics, or something like that. Uh, and I think the big problem we have in our education system is by the time somebody's 19, it's like, what are you gonna major in? What are you gonna specialize in? Instead of, in, and this is even worse in England where I did my graduate work, you have to specialize. And I would say, for heaven's sake, do a dual major that has one of the humanities or arts and one of the hard sciences. And by the way, I will now, having preached to the choir, get a few boos by saying, scientists like Neil are much more open to the beauty of art. But when I talk to people say, oh, we need arts education, we don't need STEM, we need STEAM, you know, I really can't stand people who don't uh, understand the difference between Macbeth and K 
King Lear, and then I say, yeah, you're right, we do need that. Do you know the difference between a transistor and a resistor? Do you know how a logical circuit using on-off switches does Boolean algebra? And they'll look at me and say, oh, no, I don't do math. I don't do science. So we, from a humanities background, have also got to move to the intersection. I, I would uh, add there that my college program, I majored, uh, my undergraduate degree is in physics. The PhD is in what's in astrophysics. Half of all the courses I took were not in the sciences or math. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the most influential on me was a, an art and design course that I took that changed how I saw the world. Well, you know that Einstein had trouble with astrophysics, meaning after he does general <laughs> relativity, he can't believe there would be black holes. He yeah, can't yeah. believe... It interfered with his creativity. Right. He can't believe that. that the universe would expand. All the things that are the astrophysical consequences of general relativity. And when he was stymied by that, he said he pulled out his violin and played Mozart because it connected him to the harmonies of the spheres. Harmonious Mundi. I will uh, say of Einstein that he was much more of a theorist than a mm -hmm. practitioner. But the question is a good one. Leonardo, for all he wanted to be thought of as an engineer who had a major impact on the diversion of rivers and all that, in the end, despite what he wanted, his huge impact is transforming art. Yeah. It is making, an, on a two-dimensional plane, a scene that looks three-dimensional. Doing what Neil said, which is taking a theatrical production and then making The Last Supper not just a moment, but a moment that begins as a narrative with Jesus saying, one of you shall betray me. You see it rippling out to the next set of apostles. Is it I, Lord? Is it uh, rippling out to the end? Finally, he that dippeth his hand. You see Judas doing it. And finally, the institution of the Eucharist, you know, where he's reaching for the bread and wine. So you see him creating three-dimensionality on a plane, Understanding sharp lines are not the way you do that, and understanding that even a Mona Lisa, even a still portrait, can actually be a drama that changes and becomes a narrative. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that that um, it's, it's why, for example, as brilliant as Leonardo was, Isaac Newton had far more impact on civilization because the physics that he invented shaped how we actually do things physically, cities, machines, uh, and it laid the groundwork for the Industrial Revolution. So uh, it'd be interesting to know if, if, if Leonardo came, up, came about during the Industrial Revolution, then his sort of engineering ideas might have taken tap. Yeah, his in engineering that. ideas are instituted 100 or 200 years later. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, so many of the things he sketched out, and that's the joy and the beauty of connecting fantasy with observation, is that eventually reality catches up with your with the imagination. Yeah, yeah. How do you reach the broader audience to pick the book up? rather than using the Cliff Notes version, to use an old phrase, of yes. a movie. And, yeah. and uh, just to ask, so the, the movie, Steve Jobs, was based on your book, just to clarify. Yeah, to... and without going into too much detail, I was uncomfortable. Um, it was loosely based on my book, but Aaron Sorkin was a screenwriter, had his, you know, his own vision. And your question is a good one, which is, I don't, I, I don't get Hollywood. I mean, I love the fact that DiCaprio and his production company... The other Leonardo. Yeah, yeah. but I'm not, um, I'm not involved died. because I just, don't, I just don't get Hollywood. And even though a uh, hundred times more people see a movie than buy a book, I just write the book. I'll ask you a question, then, Neil. Did you see the Genius series on Einstein? Yes, I, I saw not all of it, but... Enough that was based on my Einstein book. They yes. bought the rights to it, and Ron Howard, you know, consult, I worked with him some on it. And that aired and on I National liked, Geographic. Yeah, yeah, and I actually liked it. Well, because it was a multi-part series. Yeah. And so now, in that medium, which now people can binge, 
Uh, there, mm. It gives the writer, yeah, producer, ten director. Yeah, 10 hours gives you. Yeah, 10 and hours I think is they different from two hours. Well, I mean, yeah. you, you watched it. Yeah. But he's riding alongside the light beam on his bicycle. A good young actor, I can't remember mm -hmm. his name, Johnny Flynn. And it's just a beautiful scene. So it's an appeal to longer format television rather than the two hour film. Or books. But, but to, I, uh, I, I can't overemphasize what you don't want to be true, and that is at least a hundred times, more likely a thousand times, more people will see a book, a movie about his book, than will ever read your book. So you can grumble about it, but if it at least triggers curiosity so that they walk by your book and say, oh, is that what that's based on? Well, they that's why I like the Einstein thing, because I yeah. think it did expose people to it. And frankly, you do that, you know, better than anybody since, I don't know, Carl Sagan, which is be able to draw people in to science by having it, not necessarily movies, but your TV shows and stuff. Yeah. I think that's okay. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. A couple more questions. Uh, and we'll get another one from up top if we've got one. Yes. I'm somewhat surprised there was no mention of music at all. With all his interests in art, did he have any involvement with yeah, music? Yeah, uh, there's a whole chapter on music in the book and other things. When I said he went to Milan, he went as part of a cultural delegation because um, Florence didn't have a great army, so its uh, influence was soft power, basically sending out its artists, its architects, its playwrights. So there's a delegation led by a playwright from the Medici with about 30 people in it, and Leonardo goes as a musician because he's invented four or five new musical instruments, one of which is called the Lyra de Bracca, which is now like a violin, but he shaped it like a horse's head. And so he brought that with his companion. He was part of the delegation. And in there, I show his understanding of waves, which you know is what you write about so often, whether it's water waves or light waves or sound waves or whatever. He understood sound waves so well that one of his great inventions that still hasn't really been produced was a keyboard instrument that made it sound through strings. In other words, like a violin. It had revolving strings, but you press, so you had the flexibility of a keyboard, but the tonal quality of strings. So there's a lot on music in the book because music is one of the sciences he loved. Indeed. Indeed. Let's take. Uh, uh, one more question up top and one down here, and we'll call it a night. Yes. Hi, good evening. Um, what can be done in the education system for young children, young students, to be more creative? Well, I do think whether it was both Einstein who ran away from the gymnasium in um, Germany, which made him learn by rote, or Leonardo, it helped that they had a visual education, that they were taught... But just to be clear, gymnasium in... Yeah. Germany is an educational institution. I think institution, this is one not the gym. auditorium yeah. that would know that okay, good, better good. than anybody. Be clear. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what Leonardo was able to do, even when he's doing Vitruvian Man, as I said, it's sort of, um, uh, well, it's not clicking now, but um, the circle and the square, he would see a mathematical problem and could visualize it geometrically. I think visual thinking is under taught in our schools. Secondly, creativity coming from imagination and fantasy, as opposed to having to learn the math and the English language arts by rote, uh, for a variety of reasons, is underdone in our school system. So, allowing people to create and invent. And I guess the third thing, and it's a theme of the innovators, but also here, is collaboration, both at school level and at university, is not generally taught. In fact, we had a name for it when I was growing up. It was called cheating. Uh, but what you should be allowed to do is not do your homework, but be part of a team that does homework together. Because that's how life works. It works through collaboration. Thank you. Uh, our last question, sir. Yes. 
Yeah, so just to kind of build on the last question for children, what, what advice would you have for parents that, uh, that want to encourage these sorts of things in their children to bring out the creativity and the observation? Yeah, qualities? I actually have a last chapter that's a little gimmicky, but it sort of says here's like 20 or 30 lessons for kids and other things, and, or for us, is first of all, A, we outgrew our wonder years. You walk today and you saw the blue sky and you did not think, why is it blue? So first of all, to get our kids to think that, <laughs> it would be helpful if we were more observant. If we saw a bird wing and tried to figure out how did it flap up or down faster? Why is the sky blue? So having the sense of curiosity, that would help, I think, instill it in our kids. And then secondly, is nurture this sort of daydreaming and the imagination and the fantasies because Leonardo blurred the line between fantasy and observation, but it led him to envision and be more creative than I think anybody in history. So Walter, you'll stick around to sign your book afterwards, is that Here's correct? That's what we do at the 92nd yes, Street <laughs> Y. So do you. <laughs> So, uh, join me in thanking Walter Isaacson. Walter. Thank you. Thank you. You're really good.